If nature comes up with a creature that has more than one head, and we aren't talking about ancient Greek myths, then this creature will clearly have problems. Take at least two-headed turtles. These are rare, amazing animals, and you can't call their life simple. And when I say rare, I mean it. There's one two-headed turtle in about every thousand hatchlings. The most striking example of a two-headed turtle is Ditto, the pond slider. Ditto's heads were constantly fighting each other over every decision the turtle made, trying to seize control of the body. They fought over where to go, what to eat, whether to dive or resurface. If you have a sibling, you can certainly imagine what it's like. They fought especially fiercely over food. Each head wanted to have it all. Naturally, this wouldn't lead to anything good, but Ditto got lucky. The turtle was discovered in time by a wildlife conservation organization. If it hadn't been, things would get really sad, because when two heads emerge from one shell, they fight over everything from food to the direction in which the animal is about to move. If one head dies and infects a living head, it quickly results in sepsis and organ failure. A surviving head can die within hours after that, since the two heads share one heart and circulatory system. So no wonder that in the wild, two-headed turtles simply have no chance to survive. Although some of them can live up to two months, the vast majority die much faster simply because they can't compete for resources. Well, predators, of course, are also a factor. Actually, let's be honest, it's difficult for most turtles to survive even with one head. But if we imagine for a moment that two heads are not a disadvantage but a perk, then Ditto would be a super turtle. If its heads could find a common ground, then one of them could stay on the surface of the water while the other would hunt underwater, not wasting any time on breathing. Or one head would watch out for predators while the other is sleeping. It's like having a clone that does half the work for you. Alas, so far there are no two-headed animals whose heads reconciled and turned their peculiarity into an advantage. Most likely they simply don't have enough time for that, and this is rather sad. After all, they didn't get to choose the way they would be born. Things are different when it comes to seals and eels. Just try to wrap your head around it. Who would stick an eel up their nose? Seals would. They're mischievous enough to try something like this just for fun. The thing is, such behavior is really dangerous. In the remote northwestern Hawaiian islands, there have been at least three or four cases of seals found with eels lodged in their noses. Although no seal has died or got seriously injured by the eel, having a dead animal in one's nose can have potentially adverse health effects. At least because, while diving, a seal with an eel in its nostril won't be able to close it, and water can enter the lungs of the animal and cause pneumonia. Not to mention that the dead eel will start to decompose, and this will lead to infections that have got to be treated. This is quite problematic when the animal lives in the wild, which is why people usually pull eels out of seals' noses. But it'd be nice if animals stopped putting them in there. Though domesticated animals have their problems too. For example, it doesn't seem like hens really care about their offspring. Unlike other birds that make their own nests and carefully lay eggs, hens don't really care about that. People make a soft landing for them on the floor, but even in such conditions, the hens somehow manage to lay eggs straight from the perch, drop the eggs, and break them. Or lay eggs while standing, which increases the risk of cracks. Does it bother the hens? Nope. They actually don't care what would happen to the offspring. But that's not even the biggest issue because hens can get addicted to the taste of their own eggs. This bad habit occurs when one hen tastes a cracked egg, and then others see it and begin to do the same. If this happens often enough, such hens have to be isolated. However, hens can peck their own eggs not only because they realized how tasty they are, but simply out of boredom or out of curiosity to check what's inside. To fix this problem, experts recommend arranging brain-stimulating activities for hens. Stimulate hens' brains. I could never expect they might need that. While hens eat their own eggs quite often, the story of the rooster named Batiar is unique in its own way. The thing is, this rooster crows until he faints. <coughs> Batiar lives in Turkey and became an internet star after his owner filmed his strange crowing. The rooster kept crowing until he got exhausted and fainted. Naturally, this unusual behavior of the rooster caused heated debate. After all, there had to be a reason why the bird is so determined to crow until he passes out. Some believe that this may be caused by the temperament of the rooster. He just doesn't know when to stop. Others suggest that Batiar may be trying to tell us something important, 
but he simply doesn't have the strength or time for people to understand it. Whatever the case, Batyar became so popular for his crowing, he was about to go on a world tour, and people were offering to buy the rooster for several thousand dollars. It's unlikely that was Batyar's plan all along, but who knows? Actually, of all animals, birds are the ones who do the stupid things most often for some reason. While hens don't care what happens to their eggs, other birds don't bother feeding the already hatched chicks. Or rather, they don't really think what they're doing. While adult birds can enjoy a variety of bird foods, a large number of seeds and nuts represent a choking risk for fledglings. If the food's too large for the fledgling's throat, it may suffocate because the food ends up in the airways and may block them. Parents of fledglings sometimes have no idea how much food their offspring needs. They bring a lot of food and put it right in their throats. Best case scenario, the fledgling will cough and shake its head after this, and the worst case, well, you get the idea. But okay, there's a reason why bird parents act like that. They're just trying too hard. What about the bird that puts its head in the crocodile's mouth? I mean, it actually put it there. Perhaps it just didn't know that crocodiles have about 4,000 tiny raised black spots on their heads, especially along their jaws, inside their mouths, and between their teeth. These spots are very sensitive, roughly like the tips of a person's fingers. Even a light touch, for example, when a bird sticks its beak into a crocodile's mouth, is registered by the crocodile, which then immediately closes its jaws around whatever is inside. Well, maybe this bird just wanted to clean the crocodile's teeth. You've probably heard of this kind of symbiotic relationship. The Egyptian plover is sometimes called the crocodile bird because it supposedly flies into the mouths of crocodiles to feast on rotting meat stuck between its teeth. Although ancient historians such as Herodotus wrote about it, modern scholars consider it more of a myth than a reality. So far, there's no photographic evidence to prove this actually happened. There are no reports or other observations by scientists. So even if the bird wanted to enter into a symbiotic relationship with the crocodile, it just became part of the myth. But my favorite example of weird and rather silly animal behavior is when animals deal with cold food. When animals come into contact with something cold, such as snow or ice cream, they sometimes experience a phenomenon called brain freeze. It sounds a bit terrifying, but the way it works is actually quite simple. One of the blood vessels in the mouth or throat cools rapidly due to the low temperature, causing an intense headache. This pain quickly disappears after the animal no longer touches the cold object. On the internet, there are many videos of cats and other animals experiencing this phenomenon. There was once even a coyote caught on camera. Although brain freeze didn't stop him, the coyote just kept walking in the cold water. Does this count as smart behavior? I'm not quite sure. It might just be a very strong urge to drink water. But actually, looking at the behavior of animals, you often think they're a little silly. Or not so little. However, this is an illusion as animals have developed sophisticated ways of finding food, avoiding predators, and navigating their environment. They simply wouldn't be able to survive if they didn't have a sufficiently advanced intellect. And these are not my assumptions, but facts proven by experiments. Take, for example, the experiments of French scientists. They gave oranges and pineapples to fruit flies on which the insects lay their eggs. But scientists would dab one kind of fruit with a nasty-tasting chemical. Some flies quickly learned to avoid bad-tasting fruits and didn't land on them, even when researchers didn't put chemicals on them. Scientists allowed these insects to breed, and as a result, they created a population of smarter flies which were more intelligent than ordinary flies. But then I wondered, if it was so easy for scientists to teach better learning skills to some insects, then why didn't the ancestors of these insects evolve the same intelligence in the wild? The answer lies in a concept that I would call costly intelligence. It's best described by an experiment with the same flies. The researchers placed smart fly larvae next to normal fly larvae and allowed them to compete for food resources. It turned out that smart fly larvae died off more often than stupid ones. Why? Well, in fact, intelligence is no different from feathers, tentacles, or petals. This is the same biological feature which has its pros and cons. Intelligence requires energy, that is, the calories that we use to power our brains. The less energy the brain spends, the more is left for some other purpose like keeping the body warm. 
building additional muscle mass and preventing illness. That is, smarter animals definitely lose the perks that dumber ones have. It's also possible that genes that improve one feature, such as intelligence, affect another one or even cause diseases. In part, this can also explain behavior that doesn't make any practical sense at first glance. For example, some animals play with each other or some objects. This may not be beneficial in terms of survival or reproduction, but entertainment can help reduce stress levels and improve the overall well-being of the population. What does it tell us? Well, don't forget to rest, and if possible, keep your head out of the crocodile's mouth, even if you have two of them. There are certain things you should not do. For example, you definitely shouldn't attack a turtle when you're a rosy pelican. Why? Well, the turtle didn't appreciate the idea of being eaten, so the retribution was terrible. The turtle not only broke the bird's beak, it tore it to shreds and forced it to retreat. You know, I've never thought a pelican's beak is actually quite a fragile thing. I mean, this is their throat pouch. After all, it's made of skin that can be ripped quite easily. As soon as a pelican catches a fish with a hook in its mouth, this tiny piece of metal will puncture the pouch. Of course, the hole left by the hook won't look the same as the aftermath of the turtle retribution, but there's nothing good about it anyway. Fish usually either fall out of such holes or get stuck in them. Hardly this'll make a pelican happy. And it looks like the pelican's jaws, like their pouches, are shaped by the environment the bird lives in. The jaws of the white pelican are much less stress-resistant than, for example, that of the brown one. Keep in mind, white pelicans often feed from the surface, while brown pelicans dive after the fish and open their beaks underwater while moving. This requires certain durability. By the way, scientists figured this out while simultaneously studying pelicans and whales. Seems like these creatures can't possibly have anything in common, though they feed in the same way. They open their mouths, scoop the water along with the prey, then discard all the excess. I never thought about it before. But back to our rosy pelican, who wasn't lucky with its lunch. Can the bird even survive with a ruptured throat pouch? At least in theory? Well, no. The fish will simply fall out and the bird will eventually starve to death. Unless a human comes to the rescue. Steve and I aren't vets to be 100% certain about that, but we found one rescue story. In Australia, a pelican was attacked by a shark. A shark? Sounds much tougher than a turtle. The predator literally bit off a chunk from the throat pouch. The pelican was rescued by people, brought to the vets, and they spent several hours in the operating room applying 200 stitches and tending to the wounds of the bird. The story ended well because the pelican, he was named Lucky by the way, got help in time and was able to return to the wild in just 10 days. But don't think we're going to tell you another story of a hungry pelican with a poor choice of prey. This time it was the bird who was the prey. For young sharks, birds are the perfect target to hone their hunting skills, especially songbirds who won't be able to take off quickly if they accidentally fall into the water. But pelicans will do too. After all, sometimes they're clumsy enough that young sharks use them for training. They need to learn how to bite prey properly. Hmm. Speaking of prey, how come that pelican from the beginning of the video dared to attack the turtle? After all, pelicans mostly eat fish, perfecting their hunting strategies up to the tiniest detail. Many pelicans fish by swimming together in groups. They can form a line or U-shape, drive fish into shallow water, and then simply scoop it out with the water like soup. But for pelicans, fish is something like a healthy food that parents and doctors recommend. It's pretty hard to make yourself eat broccoli when there's so many burgers around, so pelicans are always ready to have some poor amphibians, crustaceans, and insects for a snack, even smaller birds or mammals. In short, the problem is that pelicans are ready to stuff anything into their beaks. I'm serious. They would try to eat anything that seems even slightly edible. Pinch a giraffe's leg? Why not? It looks delicious. Try to bite a dog. Swallow a bear cub. A cat? Donkey ear? Hell, even a kangaroo seems like a good enough dinner for a pelican. Or even a capybara. Good thing capybaras are friendly enough not to pay attention to this. It's one thing when they try to eat something alive, but the pelican that swallowed the phone? And not just swallowed, but first snatched it from someone's hand. Fortunately, people came to the rescue again and pulled the phone out of the bird. Though actually, this story could have a different ending because pelicans are too cocky. Sometimes they try to swallow large, very large prey, and they just choke. 
Like in the north of Minnesota, where a pelican decided to eat a large walleye. But the fish got stuck in the bird's throat because it was too big. The pelican died, and the walleye survived. If fish could snicker wickedly, that walleye probably would. Another similar story happened in the Sor Sorovar Bird Sanctuary in India. Again, there was a large pelican and a large fish. Well, this time, there were people nearby who took out an overly large supper from the bird's throat in time and did surgery. Seems like pelicans, with their gluttony and strange conviction they can eat everything, need people's help more often than any other animals. However, sometimes they don't need surgeons. This woman, Beth Weir, is an animal rescue volunteer. And yes, she just put her hand down the pelican's throat and pulled the fish out. That's right, Beth did it with her bare hands. Did this pelican know he was trying to swallow much more than he could? Hard to say. Maybe he acted like that fellow who wanted to eat a capybara. Or maybe he just made a tiny mistake in his calculations. And now let's go back to that turtle from the beginning of the video. It's not even that it was too big for a pelican. The thing is, it wasn't the turtle you'd want to take on. It's not entirely clear from the video, but Steve and I think it was a narrow-headed soft-shell turtle. It's quite large and it's found in India. It's also bloody carnivorous and aggressive. Burrowing into the sand, the turtle waits for the prey to be within its reach. When this happens, the turtle's head quickly pops out of the shell to grab it. And yes, these turtles have very, very powerful jaws. It's an animal that'll most certainly bite a human if given the opportunity because, well, because it can. It doesn't like company. Moreover, judging by some studies, some soft-shell turtle species bite with about the same force as not very big dogs. But not all dogs are aggressive. And now imagine this creature suddenly realizes that some kind of pelican's trying to eat it? <laughs> yeah, seems like the pelican got off easy. A relative of the Indian turtle, the Florida softshell turtle, which lives in the southeastern United States, has such a powerful bite, it can actually bite off a person's finger. If it tries hard enough, of course. They also warn future turtle owners about this. Even baby turtle bites are very painful. But our unfortunate rosy pelican suffered not only because of the powerful jaws and bad temper of the turtle, its claws are also a formidable weapon. It has three on each forelimb. These claws are sharp enough to tear apart anything that gets in the way. Actually, let's be honest. Turtles quite often try to eat birds. For example, a snapping turtle, a large, powerful animal, once grabbed a pelican right in front of a bunch of bystanders. Some of them suggested it was some kind of self-defense. The turtle was just scared for its life. But snapping turtles are omnivores. Careless birds are just an item on their regular menu. The pelican from the previous video was lucky, the bird managed to free itself. Perhaps it was too large, because snapping turtles have a specially designed hunting tactic. They grab a bird that's landed on the water by the leg, clench the jaw tight, drag the bird underwater, keep it there until the poor prey drowns. Well then, it's lunchtime. A simple and effective way of hunting, which actually doesn't even require any special effort from the turtle. By the way, if the turtle really wants to, it can also hunt a pigeon. True, it'll have to get out of the water for a while, but the strategy will remain the same. And if you think that only those turtles that live in the water and move fast enough eat birds, then ha! Their terrestrial counterparts also don't mind having a bird for breakfast. Or even better, if that's a chick that can't fly away. Yes, a giant tortoise hunts a cute bird. It looks a bit ridiculous and clumsy, but the tortoise doesn't give up. Scientists were shocked when they saw it. That is, for a long time, it was believed that giant tortoises, which can now only be found in the Seychelles and Galapagos Islands, are herbivores. Well, occasionally they might eat snail shells and bird bones. Turned out that sometimes they also eat birds whole. And how do you like this fact? Tortoises rise up, extending their limbs and tail so that finches could rid them of ticks. Is that a perfectly normal situation in the animal world? Of course. But sometimes, right during the cleaning, tortoises drop unexpectedly. And the birds, which at that moment are in the lower part of the shell, are flattened. And then the tortoises eat them! Stories like this always seem like jokes to tortoise experts. Until there was footage of a tortoise eating a chick. 
And you know, I get why the scientists were in doubt, but in order to check whether a tortoise can actually be predatory, you need to understand whether it's capable of digesting meat. So Steve and I checked the research and… turns out that no one knows that. Scientists have no idea because it never occurred to anyone that tortoises could be predators. Hunters. Well, it does sound ridiculous. There are no doubts about the snapping turtle, though. It's aggressive and has very powerful jaws. Well, not like that of a croc, of course, but the bite force is estimated at 208 to 226 newtons. Enough to break a bone. Even an alligator snapping turtle, which has a weaker bite, can easily crush a human hand. And yes, it's just a fake model, but its density is the same as that of a real one. Somewhere around 160 newtons is enough to crush the hand to pieces. Actually, there's been a circulating myth that the alligator snapping turtle, not to mention the common snapping turtle, can bite everything that gets into its mouths. Even a very strong piece of wood. Even a broom handle. So, that's not a myth. Scientists have tested that, and turtles really can do that. When you fell, your broom... Well, there was a turtle in... Well... A snake decided to eat a porcupine. Doesn't sound like a bright idea. And yet this happened. In 2015, a weirdly swollen python was discovered in a game reserve in South Africa. At first, the park staff had no idea what exactly the snake's dinner was, until one morning it was found dead. It was then that the people found a 30-pound porcupine inside. Apparently, the python fell from the rocky ledge, and the impact made the quills pierce the digestive tract. As a result, the python died. Did the snake know that wasn't the safest prey to eat? I think it did. According to snake experts, it's not unusual for pythons to feed on porcupines. They're generally not very picky, though they can't digest the quills. According to a 2003 study, they sometimes pierce the snake's body, and it seems like this can happen even after the rest of the porcupine has already been digested. But the snakes still continue to take risks. Imagine how hungry they must be. Unlike pythons, dogs that become victims of porcupines aren't going to eat anyone. They're driven by curiosity. What is this strange thing rustling ahead? To be honest, when I first saw a porcupine, I was also curious. The only difference is that I didn't get closer and didn't dive into the quills head first. But dogs do that because they explore the world with their nose. As a result, dogs hurt their faces, sometimes even from the inside. Come on, good boys don't bite porcupines. Catfish are another matter. They are fish, and you don't expect much from them. They often swallow things that aren't meant to be swallowed. Fish hooks, some kind of trash, turtles. Turtles? Hmm, seems to be true. A five-foot-long catfish, which tried to swallow a turtle, was pulled out of the German Göttingen Kiesi Lake. Well, you know, these guys are omnivores, and the catfish probably just couldn't resist the temptation, but overestimated its strength. The fish suffocated. Very ironic of nature. The turtle, by the way, also died. It turned out to be too big and just got stuck in the catfish's throat, leaving both of them no chance to survive. But if you think a turtle's an odd choice, what about a pigeon? I honestly never expected catfish would start preying on pigeons, but they do. They swim up to the pigeons who just want a drink, and then they lunge at them like, I don't know, like crocodiles lunge at antelopes at a watering hole. The difference is that you can actually expect this behavior from crocodiles. As for the beavers, wait, what beavers? Where did the beavers come from? Where's the missing page? Why is there a third page after the first one? Hey, Steve! Steve! All right. So, beavers. These guys start having problems when it comes to planting. To build a dam, they need a tree. A tree needs to be gnawed. The gnawed tree will fall. The question is, where exactly? Well, right on the beaver. It's not some isolated case that happened only once. Occasionally, trees fall on beavers. Though usually, beavers watch out for that and jump back in time. But there's a difference between knowing it's time to jump and understanding where exactly to jump. Sometimes animals just get confused and, well, you get the idea. But even if beavers didn't need to build dams, they simply need to chew on something hard because their teeth never stop growing and they do so at an alarming rate. Four feet per year. That's more than the body length of an adult beaver. If the beaver doesn't chew on something, it can become sort of saber-toothed. 
Well, it'll also die for sure. How could you survive with teeth like that? Or if your own mother feeds you cigarettes? On a beach in Florida, a black skimmer bird was spotted literally feeding its chick a cigarette butt. And it wasn't an attempt to teach the chick how to be a bad boy. These birds catch prey right from the water, skimming along it with their sharp beak. They don't see what's floating there. If it floats, it means it's alive. If it's alive, then it's edible. If it's edible, then it can be fed to the chick. When it comes to people, you don't need to tell me that cigarettes are generally a harmful thing. What about birds? Birds that can mistake cigarette butts for food are much smaller than us. It takes a smaller dose of nicotine to poison them. There are no exact statistics on this topic, but there were stories about, for example, an African gray parrot whose organs failed due to eating cigarette butts. Even if nicotine doesn't lead to death, it can result in nausea, vomiting, and convulsions in the animal. Smarter birds don't try to eat cigarette butts, they use them for their own purposes. Before mankind invented cigarettes, some birds carried certain herbs into their nest to get rid of parasites. But new times require new solutions. So urban birds began to carry cigarette butts into their nests. It's known that nicotine can indeed act as an arthropod repellent. Well, people know this, not animals, but they apparently also figured this out. So if you believe the studies, and yes, there are studies about cigarette butts and nests, then it seems like birds even managed to put nicotine to good use. The thing is, even a simple exposure to a cigarette butt through the beak causes genetic damage that can lead to cancer. In short, smoking is bad. Don't do this. After stories about birds who figured out how to use cigarette butts to disinfect their nests, the behavior of eagles seems especially funny, because these majestic, proud birds crash into twigs. I'm serious, they really do this. When they're about to land in a nest, they miss and look as ridiculous as it gets. Maybe it's the wind or miscalculations, or maybe the eagles have always had trouble landing and are used to it. And we just had no clue. Imagine you're a baby eagle and you see your parent flying towards you, then crashing into the nearest tree. Ouch! This feeling of embarrassment for a parent who did something silly? But you know who got really unlucky? This baby elephant. Because he got up in the wrong place at the wrong time. I don't think the elephant deliberately marked the baby. And to be honest, I don't think he was offended. Actually, this is a completely normal behavior for elephants. And baby elephants even consume the poop of adults on purpose because it contains bacteria that aren't yet produced in baby stomachs. Well, I hope you aren't eating anything right now. If you are, my bad. Meanwhile, rams, rams, what is it with the script today? You know what, I'll find something really interesting. Here, koalas. Everyone knows koalas are very cute animals who are endangered because of humans. Well, humans are to blame for everything that happens on Earth. So I believe few people think about koala intelligence. Actually, koalas are incredibly stupid animals. Since they have to eat eucalyptus leaves, which don't provide much energy, koalas have reduced their energy consumption, thereby reducing brain size and starting to think as little as possible. That's thrifty. It even sounds reasonable, but only until the fires begin. Unlike kangaroos, birds, or snakes, koalas don't run from fire, but climb trees to the canopy where they can curl up and wait. For what? Well, until everything sorts itself out. You get it, right? Everything around it is burning, and the koala just sits on a tree like, well, this is fine. <laughs> Does it ring any bells? This is fine. Do you need any more proof that koalas are, shall we say, not the smartest creatures? Look, this guy has no idea that the tree painted on the wall isn't real. He isn't bothered by the fact he couldn't grab the leaves the first time, or the second, or the third. Actually, koalas are so stupid they can't even figure out that the eucalyptus leaves they're trying to eat might not be on a tree. Such a complicated concept doesn't fit in their plain little brains. If you get a bunch of eucalyptus leaves and put them on a plate in front of a koala, the animal won't know what to do with them. Which is why in all rehab centers, koalas are fed only from branches. And you know, knowing all this, it's weird that koalas managed to survive up to the 21st century. Whew. Well, looks like I did a good job finding interesting facts on my own, let alone in a couple of minutes. Ain't that right, Steve? All right, what's with these rams of yours? Rams jump, and they do it often and usually with success. Like this male who was calmly minding his business on the mountain, 
then saw sheep behind the fence and decided that it was time to visit them. But he didn't take into account the electric cable above, so he just hung there. Of course, the animal tried to free itself, but for all its effort, it only slid down the wire and hung at a height of 16 to 20 feet above the ground. This is how locals found this ram. They thought for a while how to help an amorous animal, and in the end, they decided to pull it back up the mountain where the animal came from. What if that wasn't a ram, but a horse? A horse on the roof! In the Canadian province of New Brunswick, a horse breeding couple discovered a one-year-old colt on their garage one morning. Perhaps he somehow jumped three feet high and climbed onto the roof? Later, when the owners tried to take the colt down, he went down just as calmly. To prevent any more horses from being on the roof, they had to set a fence up there. Just think about it, a fence on the roof to keep horses away. After that, turtles that ride alligators actually seem normal. Yeah, they do ride them. For an alligator, turtles are more like a hard-to-get canned food. But they don't ask predators permission when they need to quickly get from point A to point B. Turtles simply use alligators as a mode of transportation, and sometimes as a place for swimming, or as a way of protection. Every time the turtles are worried about their safety, they climb on the alligator. What do the reptiles think about this? Well, they don't seem to be aware of it. The skin on their back is quite thick. Imagine you swimming calmly, not knowing a turtle is riding on you, and your friends are laughing at you. But you know what I'm interested in? Do the turtles themselves know where they're going? Because some sea turtle species just swim. An international team of scientists mapped the movements of hawksbill sea turtles. Turns out that during migrations over short distances, these animals chose very strange routes. One individual, for example, swam 811 miles to reach an island which was only 109 miles away. It's like heading for a certain store in the mall, checking out eight more stores along the way. Why do turtles do that? Most likely the reason lies in the geomagnetic map. It's not very accurate. That is, guided by the Earth's magnetic field, the turtle can realize something is off only when it deviates too much from the course. As long as the direction is more or less accurate, it can circle around for months without stopping for snacks. Yeah, no foods included during the travels. One would think animals that were used during wars can't possibly fear anything. Sometimes, however, monitor lizards can't even handle their food. Recently, there's been an unpleasant incident in Singapore. A monitor lizard was found dead after trying to swallow a large fish. The lizard's carcass, floating next to a boat, was discovered by a local man. They say the fish was spiky, so the monitor lizard not simply choked on the huge prey and died. The spikes must have made the lizard suffering even worse. It's actually kind of particularly sad. You're just trying to eat, and your own lunch kills you. And that's given your history of conquering forts. And this is not the only case like this. On February 24th, 2021, a monitor lizard was spotted devouring a large python in Singapore's Ulu Pandan Canal. Photos and videos taken at the location show that the predator was already halfway through its meal. And the monitor lizard seemed determined to finish it, despite the crowd of onlookers and their cameras. Unfortunately for the lizard, the python was too big. At one point, the monitor lizard stopped eating, choking on the snake, which by then was almost completely swallowed. After struggling with its prey for a while, the monitor lizard eventually regurgitated the python and disappeared into the water. In a way, one can even say this story ended well. And here's another example of how reckless monitor lizards could be. A video posted in early 2022 shows a disturbing scene of a monitor lizard holding a turtle in its mouth, struggling to swallow it. The turtle was alive and tried to escape every time its shell touched the ground. But the monitor lizard kept a firm grasp on its prey, not letting it slip away. It remains unclear whether the monitor lizard managed to consume the turtle eventually, but a user who witnessed a similar incident in the same location left a comment under the post saying the incident ended tragically. The next morning, the monitor lizard was dead in the water, choked by the turtle, which it was unable to swallow. A few days later, I had to inform the authorities as there was a decaying smell. It was removed, he added. Okay, things are pretty clear when it comes to fish, snakes, and turtles, but what about octopuses? These cephalopods are a delicacy for the monitor lizards. These big lizards actively hunt them whenever possible, and are happy to eat them. I can't blame them for that, since octopuses are really delicious but only when properly cooked.
Monitor lizards can't do that, so they resort to other strategies like periodically hitting octopuses against hard objects nearby right during eating. For example, they may hit them against tree roots, because the octopus certainly doesn't appreciate being eaten, which makes it an incredibly dangerous prey. The thing is, the suckers of an octopus can get stuck in the throat of the monitor lizard during swallowing, which could cause suffocation. To prevent this from happening, it's best to tear the octopus into very small chunks before swallowing. Unfortunately, monitor lizards are used to swallowing food whole and don't really have any clue how to properly cut octopus. So, for a monitor lizard, the chances of choking on an octopus and dying are huge. Strictly speaking, there are other creatures that pose a danger to monitor lizards, though only to young ones. A battle between a young monitor lizard and a western yellow-bellied sand snake was observed in the Mala Mala Game Reserve in Mpumalanga, South Africa. The two creatures were almost equal in terms of strength, no one wanted to yield, so the struggle went on for more than an hour. At first, it was not even clear who was the prey and who was the predator. Gradually, it became obvious that the snake was winning as it stuck its teeth firmly into the lizard's neck. The young lizard desperately tried to break free, but it didn't work as the snake tightened its grip even harder. Eventually, the snake managed to constrict its prey's entire body and swallow it whole. But sometimes the monitor lizards attacked by snakes get lucky, even if they've already been swallowed. An elderly woman in Bangkok, Thailand, heard the sounds of a struggle in her house. But when she went down to investigate, she found a python instead of burglars. It was stretched out along the kitchen floor, and the snake's belly was noticeably bulging. Rescue workers who arrived on the scene found that the snake had almost entirely devoured the monitor lizard, only a small section of its tail was sticking out of its jaws. Seeing the people, the python tried to escape, but was not allowed to, and then it simply regurgitated the monitor lizard. This is a natural reaction to stress. It makes it easier for snakes to escape. Imagine everyone's surprise when it turned out that the monitor lizard was still alive. After a while, it even started running around the room, trying to hide from its rescuers. When the monitor lizard was checked for injuries, it was found that it hadn't suffered any from the snake. Why the snake didn't constrict the lizard before swallowing is a mystery, but the snake must have surely regretted it. Anyway, there's a reason why pythons act like that. They just want to eat, and the monitor lizards look too delicious and nutritious. However, the story of India's elephant called Madhuri surprised many. This elephant lives in Corbett National Park and is known for her aggressive nature, but this aggression manifests in a rather weird way. The elephant catches the monitor lizards. Madhuri is generally good at catching lizards, but usually she targeted smaller specimens. Photographers managed to capture Madhuri grabbing a monitor lizard by the tail and swinging it around like a toy. From time to time, she dropped the monitor lizard from a considerable height, so there was little chance for the lizard to survive. Also, this strange game went on for several days. They say it looked fascinating, though definitely not for the monitor lizard. Hey, she ready? Ready. Initiating spin. It's worth saying that the Varanidae family includes a large and diverse group of lizards, and I would call the Komodo dragon the leader of this group. It's the largest lizard species in the world. Matt Hurry is lucky she was dealing with a smaller species because Komodo dragons can grow to 10 feet long and weigh 150 pounds or more. Being this big, it's hardly surprising that Komodo dragons can take down really huge prey, including wild boar, deer, water buffalo, and even elephants. Well, not the ones we're used to, of course. During the Pleistocene, the now-extinct dwarf elephants are thought to have roamed the islands where the ancestors of the Komodo dragons lived. Fossil evidence suggests that these elephants were periodically preyed upon by huge lizards. Fortunately for today's elephants, Komodo dragons, due to their size and limited habitat, usually feed on smaller animals. As far as we know, they haven't changed their eating habits yet. Now imagine you have to use the restroom. You mind your own business when suddenly you see a head of a huge lizard sticking out of the toilet bowl. To be honest, I'd be scared. I'd probably even scream. That's exactly what happened to a British tourist who was on a vacation in Thailand. The monitor lizard stared at him for three minutes before turning around and going back to where it came from. What exactly this lizard wanted is unclear. How did it end up in the toilet bowl in the first place? We managed to find the answer to this question. They sprayed insecticide outside, which caused the lizard to leave its natural habitat in search of a safer place. The lizard tried to escape through the sewers and accidentally ended up in the human bathroom. 
Well then, apparently it looked at the human and realized it wasn't welcome here. Actually, this kind of incident is not as uncommon as one might think. Monitor lizards are known for their ability to crawl through pipes and squeeze into tight places like toilets and sinks. However, they don't always manage to find their way out. And here's a story proving this. In 2021, a four-foot-long Bengal monitor lizard was found stuck right in the toilet panhole of an Indian family. The family said they first spotted the lizard near the toilet on Sunday and opened the window hoping it would climb out. Alas, apparently the animal couldn't climb the tiled wall and decided to find another way out and got stuck in the panhole where it waited to be rescued. Don't you think monitor lizards are kind of unfortunate? Okay, I can understand when an animal suffocates or can't squeeze through a hole, but it turns out that monitor lizards can also die from stress. Yeah, these giant lizards that used to eat elephants and then conquer forts. There was a tragic incident at the Delhi Zoo which cost it four of its monitor lizards. According to the post-mortem report, the reptiles died of shock after a staff member removed them from their enclosures while they were hibernating. Monitor lizards typically hibernate from November through March each year, and during this period it's best to leave them alone because they don't need food or water. Also, they're prone to temperature fluctuations if they're disturbed. And apparently they get really stressed. But guess what? Monitor lizards can also die when they hibernate. When the temperature drops below 45 degrees Fahrenheit, lizards and iguanas undergo a temporary cold shock. We've already mentioned raining iguanas in Florida when iguanas were falling from trees, but iguanas are not the only lizards in the state. There are also quite a few monitor lizards there. Anyway, monitor lizards sleep in tree branches because it's harder for predators to reach them there. However, when the temperature drops sharply, the lizards get so cold that they lose the ability to move their limbs. Then, if a tree branch moves, they fall to the ground just like iguanas. Well, such a fall can be fatal for a monitor lizard, although this is a rare occasion. What else can be dangerous for monitor lizards? Oddly enough, it's toads. But it's a threat that comes from within, so to speak. Cane toads are a serious issue for Australia. Before this invasive species ended up in the local wildland, the monitor lizards were doing fine, but the toads ruined everything. Varanus panoptus is thought to be one of the most affected species. These are small, omnivorous reptiles that live in the rainforests of Australia. In recent years, up to 90% of these reptiles have died because they ate toads. The problem is that even if a monitor lizard simply bites a toad, it can still die because it's not immune to the toxins in the toad's skin. Cane toads were brought to Australia to control pests damaging sugarcane harvest, but the amphibian population quickly spiraled out of control. Well, you probably know how it happens. No predators, plenty of food to eat. Why not multiply at a terrifying rate? Something had to be done about that. But you can't make the monitor lizards immune to toads' toxins quickly enough, as they've always lived and evolved without any toads around. So scientists came up with an ingenious solution. They began feeding smaller toads to the monitor lizards. They were still toxic, but not lethal. Their toxins just made the monitor lizards sick without causing permanent damage. Eating just one or two meals like that was enough for the lizards to get the idea. Though actually, poisonous toads cause problems for monitor lizards simply because they aren't used to fighting their toxins. Things are different when it comes to the king cobra. A snake about 15 feet long got into a fight with a giant monitor lizard, and they fought for at least several minutes. Let me remind you that the venom of the king cobra is very toxic. It can kill an adult human within 30 minutes if no antivenom is used. However, despite this, the monitor lizard emerged from the battle unscathed. It fled into the woods without any sign of weakness or injury. The snake was also unharmed, but this is not the point here. What's really interesting is how the monitor lizard managed to handle the venom. The lizard's slow metabolism is partly responsible for its resistance to venom. Its body processes toxins more slowly compared to other animals, which helps it neutralize many harmful substances more efficiently. Oh, and don't forget about the thick skin that acts as a barrier. The strong immune system of monitor lizards also allows them to quickly deal with many toxins, though not when the toxins come from the cane toad and right in the lizard's mouth. A dead whale is something that always gets people's attention, especially if those people are doing whale research. But a huge carcass in the water will also attract those who don't mind having a snack. Researchers have repeatedly observed sharks gathering in groups near the carcasses of dead whales and feasting wildly, taking advantage of such a great opportunity. 
During these feasts, you can see at least 60 sharks circling around their prey, but scientists say there could actually be more than 100 of them. Whale carcasses are simply that great of a dinner option for many shark species. Best of all, sharks don't have to do anything to eat heartily. Except that a great opportunity to feast can also pose huge risks. But to realize this, you have to figure out why dead whales end up on the surface after death in the first place. There are several reasons why this happens. Let's take the most common one. When cetaceans decompose, their bodies fill with gas and their insides expand, which gives the animal extra buoyancy. However, gas is not the only reason why whales continue to float against their will after death. They also have big deposits of fat. Well, more like huge deposits of fat. Even if the whale falls apart while decomposing, its heavy parts like bones will sink, while the lighter parts, where there's a lot of fat, will stay at the surface. Eventually, they form a disgusting sticky stain, a trail of blood, fat, and flesh that can stretch for miles across the surface of the ocean. Fat, rich, huge cetacean species such as humpback whales sometimes float for more than a week, making them perfect targets for scavengers such as sharks and seabirds. However, dead cetaceans don't just float to the surface, they can also deflate. I've mentioned this more than once, it happens roughly like this. As whales decompose, gas is released and can't find its way out. Their insides become liquid. Sooner or later, all this nasty content will take the path of least resistance and go out through the whale's mouth. But before this happens, we have a severely bloated whale, a giant bomb full of bones, intestines, and other entrails. And if it's a pregnant female, there's a fetus inside. In such situations, the dead calf has been known to burst out of its mother's mouth like a rocket, and the gas that leaves the carcass researchers call the worst smell of their life. Now think about it. If a fetus or intestines can leave a dead whale's body at high speeds through a fitting opening, what happens when that opening is made by a shark? Sharks take their first bites while the whale carcass is still full of gas, which means it can suffer a serious blow right down its throat. With some heavy internal organ or bone, it can even lose a couple of teeth. Well, sharks are prepared for this. They already lose their teeth every day, and they don't need to go to the dentist, luckily. I think sharks are aware, though, that eating whale carcasses can be risky. At any rate, they don't eat everything they come across. Yeah, I know it's hard to believe it after seeing movies like Jaws, but observations suggest that sharks don't fight each other to death once they're near a whale carcass. And they don't even tear their prey apart in random places just to get a bite of something. It's not like that at all. During the observations, the scientists noted that the sharks were very picky and targeted the nutritious fat first. They also took what they call test bites to find out what they wanted to eat. And they only took a full bite when they liked the contents. When a shark gets a mouthful of muscle, it tends to spit it out, assuming that the concept of spitting even applies to these creatures. That said, it's not easy to tear off whale fat, even with their damn sharp teeth, so the sharks have to pull it from side to side. It may look a little aggressive, but in fact, the shark knows exactly what it's doing. The fact that sharks are picky eaters is apparent due to their ability to distinguish between prey and non-prey, as shown when they bite surfboards or swimmers in wetsuits and quickly realize they are not edible. But we'll come back to the shark bites a little later. As I've mentioned earlier, sharks go crazy when they encounter a whale carcass. It's truly a feast for them with so much food available, everyone is welcome to join the feast. Sharks are among the first at the buffet table because they have sharp teeth and powerful jaws that can tear pieces of fat from the carcass. Some sharks eat so much, they swim away with bloated bellies. But when sharks bite and shake a dead whale, many fragments of the carcass scatter in different directions and end up as food for smaller organisms. Sharks also make holes in the fat, and other animals such as seabirds can get to the whale meat through them. You remember the carcass floats on the surface, right? Then after the sharks tear the whale apart, it sinks to the bottom, and the feast continues. This time it's the scavenger's turn as they'll feed on the carcass for decades. This cluster of hungry creatures includes crabs, fish, worms, and many small crustaceans called isopods and amphipods. Since they're small, there's enough food to sustain them for a long time. If the whale carcass drifts towards the shore, large land scavengers are after it, namely scientists. It may sound strange, but humans act roughly the same way as animals. Except they don't eat what they cut off the whale, but use it for research. And it's not always easy to get to the carcass, so scientists have to collect samples in rather unusual ways. For example, one researcher used a saw mounted on a pole, the kind used to lop trees, 
And while he was reaching for the whale standing on the rocks, his colleagues held him so he wouldn't fall. If the whale is washed upon the shore or beach, smaller scavengers come to pick it over. Usually these are birds, rove beetles, ghost crabs, flies, and many others. The most important thing is that none of these scavengers are at risk. Because sharks already did the most dangerous work, the gas from the whale is out and eating is safe. Now let's go back to sharks biting things they shouldn't be biting. There's a theory that says these predators attack swimmers or surfers because they mistake them for seals. And seals, as you probably know, are one of the shark's favorite foods. To test how much humans look like seals, scientists had to do a couple of experiments. The team used underwater cameras to record what seals and sea lions, the shark's natural prey, looked like from a shark's perspective. Then they did the same with human swimmers and surfers from the same angle. Turned out that sharks really can get confused. These marine predators are colorblind with sensitive eyes and not the sharpest vision, which means that the environment often looks blurry for sharks. In such conditions, it can be difficult to tell whether the creature swimming above you is a person on a surfboard or a seal. Except for details like arms, it all looks too similar. But a shark with poor eyesight just won't notice the arms. And given that surfers are attacked more often than anyone else, the theory seems quite plausible. Yes, sharks just get confused. Yes, sharks bite humans because they mistake them for someone else. Apparently, humans are not a part of a shark's regular diet. Compared to seals, we aren't nutritious enough to make the effort of catching us worthwhile. Most shark attacks on humans occur because sharks are confused or unsure and may take a test bite out of caution. Sharks don't realize how fragile we are when they bite us. Sharks may not realize that humans are a risky meal option. If a shark does eat a human, it faces the possibility of being hunted down as a man-eating shark by humans seeking revenge. Though actually, stories of animals making poor choices are not uncommon. In 2021, about 60 Australian freshwater crocodiles were found dead in Dangu Gorge National Park in Australia. It seems they were poisoned. Imagine the researchers' surprise when they realized that the crocodiles' deaths seemed to be caused by cane toads. You'd think, well, how can a cane toad possibly be a threat to a croc? It's no match to it. Unlike the croc, the cane toad has no sharp teeth, powerful jaws, and all that. The predator can swallow it faster than the toad can do anything about it. But even despite the size difference, the toad, as they say, has the last laugh. Since 2005, dead Australian freshwater crocodiles have become a common sight for the locals to the point that it might be called a mass extinction, if one were to exaggerate a bit. You okay there, Mr. Crocodile? Huh? And it's the cane toad, a member of an invasive species that's taking over Australia right now that's to blame for this mass extinction. Crocodiles are just some of their victims who end up in the wrong place at the wrong time. During the dry season, food becomes scarce. Crocodiles get hungrier and cane toads look for water. When the two species cross paths, this results in death. Establishing a connection between cane toads and a stack of deceased crocodiles is usually quite difficult, partly because the crocs digest food too quickly. It's rare to find toad remains in the stomach of a dead crocodile. However, researchers were able to link the regions in which crocodiles died to the distribution of toads, and they overlap. So it looks like we have a suspect that releases a toxin dangerous to many predators that aren't immune to it. The toxin doesn't have time to affect the crocodile while the toad is in its mouth because the prey gets into its stomach very quickly. But after that, there's no way to get rid of the source of the toxin. The crocodile dies, and the researchers then can't figure out what killed it. And as is usually the case with invasive species, Australian animals are simply not ready to interact with cane toads. These toads were introduced to Australia in 1935 to control sugarcane-eating pests. But instead of fighting the evil, they joined it and began to multiply, spreading across the continent at a terrible rate. Along the way, cane toads are also destroying local species. This is why you should think twice before inviting someone. In an effort to protect native species, scientists are trying to teach them that eating cane toads is not a good idea. It's better not to have any contact with them at all, and in order to make animals understand this, they came up with a peculiar strategy. Scientists sedated several cane toads, removed their toxic parts, and then injected them with a special solution and put them as baits for the crocodiles. The idea is very simple. A predator who eats this special chunk of the toad will feel nauseous and will avoid toads in the future. If you've ever had food poisoning, you know how it works. There are, of course, traditional methods of dealing with invasive species. 
Typically, these involve manually removing undesired animals from the environment or fencing off a certain area they've already occupied. But the problem is that just one female cane toad can lay 30,000 eggs twice a year, so no traditional methods would work here. Reducing the number of cane toads is simply not realistic. The only thing left to do is mitigate the effects. But don't think that absolutely all Australian animals are defenseless against croaking invaders. The white ibis has come up with a unique way to eat cane toads that initially confused observers. Seems like the ibises figured out that it was the toad's skin that was dangerous. They would toss their prey in the air and then either wipe it on the wet grass or go to the nearest water source and rinse the toad there. That is, the ibis literally washed away the toxins before swallowing the toad's whole. Not even all people realize they have to wash their food before they eat it. They have a lot to learn from white ibises. Other birds, such as hawks and crows, have also been seen eating cane toads, but they don't do it as gracefully as the ibis. They simply flip the toad on its back and rip out its insides, leaving poison glands untouched. Yep, the prey is eaten, the predator is still alive, but you have to admit it's not as spectacular as swallowing a toad whole. So some species have adapted to eating toads, others, like crocodiles, are taught by humans to avoid them. But how catastrophic is the situation really? I mean, is everything lost? The infestation of toads can't be stopped? Well, not really. It's possible to make some toxic animals completely safe to others. Take for example, tetrodotoxin, found in animals like pufferfish, Japanese fire-bellied newts, and Costa Rican variable harlequin toads. Scientists used to think that each of these animals had found a way to synthesize tetrodotoxin independently of each other, but then they came to the conclusion that this was unlikely. Although it does happen, it's still rare for completely distinct animals to get identical adaptations through evolution. Turned out that when puffer fish are raised in tanks with filtered bacteria-free water, they lose their toxicity. Similarly, a special diet deprives amphibians of toxicity. While scientists haven't yet tried to do something similar with cane toads, that doesn't mean their toxicity can't be turned off. Maybe we should just wait. Science is advancing, after all. But don't you think we're ignoring the large land animals? Meanwhile, they also have problems with dangerous food that they don't even consider dangerous in the first place. A truly horrific story happened in Kruger National Park. A hungry lion cub tried to eat a buffalo that was recently killed, but its head just got stuck in the backside of the carcass. The lion cub tried desperately to get free, kicking and rolling around on the ground, but all his efforts were in vain. His head remained inside. In the end, after some time, the lion cub used up all his strength and passed out. The other members of the pride didn't help him. They didn't react at all. And yet the cub was lucky there were no predators around ready to take advantage of his troubled situation, and the other lions were slowly eating the buffalo, which means that the cub didn't lose access to oxygen. After all, with what little left of the carcass, the lion cub probably managed to get out. Moreover, the witnesses said that later when they returned to the place, the lion cub was gone which means he stayed alive and well after all. Can you imagine if during their meal the lions had been attacked by hyenas who also wanted to eat the buffalo? The lion cub would have been easy prey. Too easy to live another day. After all, the animal world is a place that doesn't forgive mistakes like this. Stories like this don't just happen to lions. In the Northern Territory, Australia, a pig was seen getting into an empty cow carcass for a snack, and it got stuck there for good. The pig desperately tried to free itself, making several attempts to squeeze through the hole through which it had climbed inside, but unfortunately no part of its body other than its head could get through. Some weird cosplay of that scene from Winnie the Pooh? Perhaps the pig just ate too much. Whoa, whoa, hold on a minute. We got a pig that decided to take a bite out of a cow and we're fine with that? What's that, Steve? Steve says that's in the nature of things. I think my world will never be the same again. Okay, I think I just forgot that pigs are omnivores and would eat anything they come across. Even if one of the pigs living in the pen dies, the others don't hesitate to eat it. Well, they could maybe leave a head, so the cow's carcass probably attracted the pig precisely because it was lying there uncontested. Who would have thought it would be a trap? Pigs aren't the only creatures you wouldn't expect to eat meat. How about this? In 2018, a pack of African wild dogs in the same Kruger National Park dared to attack a huge hippo to claim its prey, and that prey was the carcass of a water buck. Anyway, that was the caption of the guy who took this photo. According to him, the water buck tried to escape from the dogs by diving into the pond, 
but instead ran into the hippo, which emerged from the depths and killed the goat with its huge jaws. The feuding parties fought over the water buck's carcass, tugging and pulling as though it were light as a feather. Eventually, the hippo withdrew into the water, leaving the dogs to claim their share. Although hippos are known to be mostly vegetarians, they sometimes make a change to their diet, namely eating meat. There are reports by scientists and amateur observers of hippos attacking, killing, and eating other animals, stealing prey from predators, or eating corpses, including other hippos. And researchers see nothing unusual about this. Meat-eating hippos are not sick or crazy, and they aren't affected by bad ecology. It's just their natural behavior, shaped by evolution. But if that's so, why don't all herbivores act this way? And anyway, why don't hippos become predators? After all, they have giant jaws with huge teeth and a very aggressive attitude. Who could stand up to such an animal? Evolution has adapted many hippos and other large herbivores to a plant-based diet, and their intestines and the microbes that live in them are adapted to ferment and digest large amounts of plant material. That means that while some herbivores may incorporate meat into their diet, intentionally or not, they can't eat it all the time. And it's not just because of their digestion. For example, antelopes, deer, and cattle are known to eat carrion, bird eggs, birds, small mammals, and fish, but they don't have the teeth or claws to catch their prey and separate the meat from the bones. Well, imagine some cow hunting hares in the woods. It just can't keep up with them. It's probably going to trip during the chase. The hippo is a different story. It has a large body and teeth and mouth unusual for herbivores, thanks to which it can hunt from ambush and pierce the flesh. Hippos have been known to eat impalas, elephants, kudus, wildebeest, zebras, and other hippos. The reason why it took scientists a while to uncover hippos' meat cravings is because of the way hippos act. Hippos are known to be more active during the dark hours, making it challenging for researchers to observe their eating habits and preferences. And knowing all this, the crocodile's decision to eat hippo calves seems, well, at the very least, not very smart especially when they're the calves in a herd of 30 adult hippos. Naturally, the poor predator was attacked not by one or two hippos, but by the whole huge herd at once. I don't even want to imagine what it'd be like to find myself in a crowd of three dozen bodies, each weighing 3,000 pounds on average. Keep in mind, these bodies also have huge heads with powerful jaws. The hippos managed to chase the crocodile away very quickly, after which one of them grabbed it with its mouth and tossed it into the water. The poor predator had no choice but to flee. This crocodile was much luckier than another one of its kin. In 2009, in a similar situation, the predator was killed. It got too close to a female hippo with its calves and the entire herd immediately stood up to protect them. At this point, the crocodile should have run away, but instead it ran up the backs of the hippos. Perhaps it just panicked and that was the worst possible decision of all. Even the crocodile's tough armor couldn't withstand the onslaught of repeated bites. After just a few seconds, its lifeless body fell into the water and disappeared from view. However, I gotta say that usually crocodiles and hippos did not attack each other. They can coexist quite peacefully in the same area and often even share the same reservoirs. The crocodiles and hippos seem to be enjoying each other's company as they bask in the sun, making for a tranquil scene. Even the young hippos are not afraid to approach the crocodiles. But how do they manage to be on such almost friendly terms? The thing is, even though a crocodile can attack a hippo and maybe, if it's lucky, even eat it, it won't. It's too dangerous. A medium-sized adult crocodile is no match for a medium-sized adult hippo especially since hippos usually live in herds and there are many adults in such herds. As a result, crocodiles and hippos live together in a stalemate where both sides are fully aware of what their opponents are capable of. In the wild, you can't fight each other just because you want to, so they try to keep out of each other's way. Can we assume that the crocodiles I mentioned earlier were young and not too experienced, so they just didn't know that it was better not to mess with hippos? Or maybe they were young, inexperienced, and blind, since they didn't see the huge herd. Generally speaking, attacking a hippo is not the only mistake a young crocodile can make. Although, I'm not even sure that what happened can be called a mistake in the literal sense of the word. In 2012, a unique incident was filmed in Kruger National Park. A crocodile got on top of a hippo and stretched out on its broad back to relax and bask in the sun. 
Even when the hippo started moving, the young crocodile wasn't frightened and stayed there for about 15 minutes before getting off. And I don't know how brave you have to be to sunbathe on a hippo, even though the three-ton beast didn't seem to notice at all that it had something a bit less than three feet long riding on its back. As for the crocodile, it probably thought it just climbed a rock and didn't even realize just how lucky it was that the rock was in a good mood. And this animal that resembles a duck is called a coot, a small waterfowl that feeds mostly on plants and small fish. When it comes to protecting their young, however, coots can be remarkably tenacious. A few years back in the Netherlands, a photographer captured remarkable images of a coot fiercely defending its chicks against a buzzard. The coot didn't stop there. It actually managed to drown the buzzard right next to its nest. The buzzard is a bird of prey with sharp talons and a beak that feeds on rodents and small birds. Naturally, it knew that it could easily attack and kill a coot, but it forgot one small detail. During the breeding season, coots go into berserker mode. So this proud mom acted very aggressively and managed to push the buzzard into the water, wetting its feathers. Even a few wet feathers was a bad sign for the buzzard, but the coot didn't stop there and drowned its opponent. Even after the buzzard stopped showing signs of life, it still wouldn't let it go for a while. If only the buzzard had known it had picked a bad time to hunt. Because breeding periods have a strange effect on many animals. For birds, this time can be really difficult. It can be both time-consuming and exhausting to care for the chicks, especially with the added stress of predator attacks. It's natural for birds to become more aggressive close to the breeding season, as before they start caring for chicks, they need to fight for potential mates. About 15 years ago in West Sussex, the locals were very concerned about the peacock's behavior, and they had a good reason for that. The birds were attacking cars because they saw their reflection on their surfaces and mistook it for a rival. It sounds absurd and even ridiculous, but the peacocks did serious damage to the cars, scratching them with their claws kung fu style. Besides, the birds scared small kids and woke up the whole neighborhood at night with their mating cries. If you've heard a peacock, you know that there's absolutely nothing pleasant about it. It's quite weird such a majestic bird has such a voice. Peacock attacks weren't registered in England alone. For example, in Singapore, in places where one can find peacocks, they install special road signs that read, park at your own risk, because if you leave the car even for an hour, then you can find a couple of scratches on it. And yes, the reason is again the mirrored surfaces. Peacocks are generally very territorial creatures who are willing to defend their area from anyone even if they have to fight with their own reflection. Peacocks are known to be the most aggressive during their breeding or mating season. Like chickens and other birds, they protect their eggs and attack everyone they see. It's impossible to calm them down, so if you see an aggressive peacock, just stay away from it. See you later.